Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our Retail and Consumer Goods Industry Forum at the Data and AI Summit. I'm Michael Ortega from the industry marketing team here at Databricks, and I'll be your host today. We have an amazing group of industry leaders joining us to share their perspectives on how data and AI are helping their organizations respond in real time to a rapidly changing retail environment, while also providing the foundation to reimagine the entire customer experience. With that in mind, I'm excited to hand it off to our first speaker today, Rob Saker. Welcome, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation on AI and retail. My name's Rob Saker. I've worked at Databricks for just over two amazing years, where I lead the retail and manufacturing industries. I come to Databricks by way of industry, having held various leadership roles at multiple companies, ranging from chief data officers to leading transformations. But Databricks is really a passion for me, as I've been able to help many companies solve the problems that I once struggled with. For those of you that are new to Databricks, the best way for me to introduce us is to give us the label of the data and AI company. And what I mean by this is that we provide a single data platform that we call the Lakehouse. And this platform unifies all your data engineering, analytics, streaming, and AI workloads. Our company roots were established by the founders of Apache Spark, and this remains an important part of our ethos as we remain committed to open standards uh, and open source. We really want to help our customers avoid vendor lock-in. Now, I don't want to gloss over the fact that we've got over 5,000 customers in just about every industry across the globe. And what are some of those customers? You can see we have customers in nearly every sector of the economy, ranging from the very largest of firms to the most innovative startups. One of the most fun parts about my job is I get to work with companies with hundreds or thousands of data scientists working on massive problems. And then the very next call, we'll be talking with a small startup working on something that's critically important to their business. Databricks works well for all ranges of company sizes. The largest companies have faith in being able to uh, process petabytes of data and solve the most advanced models. Well, the startups know that they can start small and scale with the same architecture as they grow. Okay, so let's talk about the past 18 months. Uh, 2020 was a remarkable year by nearly every measure. COVID wreaked havoc on many parts of the economy, and unfortunately, we're still dealing with COVID in severe forms in many parts of the world. Lockdowns forced sharp, sharp changes in consumer behaviors. Perhaps no change was as stark as what we saw in retail. In retail, we saw an immediate shift to e-commerce as stores became locked down. In fact, in 2020, we saw the same amount of growth in e-commerce as a percentage of total retail as it previously took 10 years to accomplish. Some categories such as grocery, drug, C-store, saw major growth in revenue, while other categories such as apparel, uh, e-commerce became the only lifeline to their business. We've also seen growth in market share for firms with e-commerce capabilities, while many non-digital firms actually went out of business. I mentioned this massive growth in market share, and this is in the grocery curve in the US. In 2020, we saw that 10 week period equaling the preceding 10 years of market share growth. So what about now? Well, as I meet with leaders across the industry, I see five common forces coming up frequently um, that are driving most of the current changes. We've seen a surge in the number of digital devices in all aspects of our life. And it's not just mobile phones, but Fitbits, home cameras, speakers, refrigerator, cars, and more. The amount of digital touch points is exploding at an exponential rate. A natural disasters, pandemics, shipping and warehouse constraints, and other external factors are disrupting our business and causing volatility. Increasingly, the data that's needed to manage our business is coming from alternative and unstructured sources outside of our organizations. Retailers and CPG firms that were able to respond rapidly to quarantines significantly outperformed companies that didn't. And a big reason why they didn't, why they excelled, was data agility. Companies need to be able to test new data sets in analytic methods and days and deliver results in weeks, not months and years. Inflation has been a fear for most companies, and it's finally showing up in the numbers. The recent CPI report showed a 4.3% inflation rate for the month of April, 
Inflation directly eats at the profit margin of retailers and consumer goods firms. And lastly, we've seen major channel shifts in 2020, and we expect other major channel shifts in 2021 as areas begin to reopen. And our challenges continue. Near the end of the year and into this year, we saw increased delays due to port blockages. The port of LA and the US saw ships at anchor for eight days, just waiting for a berth. We've seen lumber costs skyrocket. The average house cost $35,000 more in 2021 than it did in 2020 to build because of this. But those wood constraints expend to cardboard, which has reached record peaks. Shipping costs have spiked. Part of the challenge in shipping is finding drivers who are vaccinated and willing to drive. And spot rate shipping from Asia to other parts of the world has also skyrocketed. And right on time, a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal. Who can forget the Ever Given, which blocked 10% of the global GDP and prevented customers from receiving their critical uh, Peloton bikes? You know, this Suez Canal situation highlighted the power of data and AI to me. On the very day that the canal blockage was announced, we shared a link to a notebook that enabled companies to quickly determine the effects and uh, potential delays and uh, versus rerouting. So we allowed a complex tax, task that would have taken weeks to now be done in hours. You know, Databricks is obsessed with helping our retail and consumer goods customers, customers deliver value. This is reflected in how we design our technology and how we work with our customers. We want to understand the problems that you're working on, what outcomes you're trying to achieve, and how to identify the quickest way to solve those problems. You know, our results speak for themselves. Databricks customers generate a positive payback on their investment in less than six months. Many generate enough ROI on the first use case to justify expanding their data and AI program for several years. But it's not just the internal financial results that are improved. The Databricks 30 is an index of the top 30 publicly data traded uh, Databricks customers across five industries. We found that this group outperforms the S&P 500 by 21 percentage points on the alpha, which is a comparison of relative performance between two indexes. If you wanted to build a portfolio of high performing stocks with low risk, building it around data and AI leaders will give you a fantastic portfolio. Now, here's more information on this Databricks 30 composition. Not only does it outperform the S&P 500, it has a beta or a risk measure of 0.97 which is less volatile than the S&P 500. Data and AI led companies generate stronger returns more rapidly and with less volatility than the S&P 500. Now we don't release the companies that comprise the Databricks 30, but they're equally weighted across our industries. Many of these companies are traditional industrial age companies, proving that data and AI isn't just a tech company feature. In fact, we found that when we removed tech companies from the index, the performance actually increased. So this is really the key learning from everything over the past 18 months. Speed matters. Speed means being able to analyze situations faster or respond to changing business conditions or provide more relevant and more accurate information in the moment. The other observation I've seen in working with firms over the past uh, 12, 18 months is that the difference between the haves and the have nots is increasing. Legacy companies focus on what happened. Data and AI leaders focus on why did it happen? What will happen? How can we make it happen? And this isn't the future, it's today, and it has been for these firms. Retailers that focus on the red circles are generating millions and billions in increased revenue and savings over their competitors. And they're putting that in their bank. Now, all of those circles in red require data and AI. You know, it's not surprising that many industry experts are now saying that data is the most valuable asset in the modern economy. However, the explosion in data availability over the last decade, combined with low cost storage, compute and machine learning environments has caused a major shift in how organizations leverage data and AI to drive future growth and manage risk. Data within the enterprise is growing exponentially and enterprises are placing increased demand, interest and importance on data analytics and machine learning 
with their future successes, not years out, but in months. 98% are investing in our active data-driven AI projects. However, successfully using data and AI to generate meaningful and measurable business outcomes remains a challenge for many with only 73%, with 73% of organizations struggling with big data and AI initiatives. When looking at AI use cases um, only, a recent survey from McKinsey found that only half of uh, organizations have adopted AI into at least one business function. Why is this? Well, a lot of it has to do with the wrong tools for the wrong job. So let's look back in history. Data warehouses are great for providing consistency, enterprise class security, and data governance, and serving reports. They're highly optimized to serve BI. But being highly optimized for BI means that they're suboptimal for things like data science and machine learning. And unfortunately, most modern data warehouses lock customers into one vendor. Conversely, data lakes are great for machine learning. They're inexpensive. They can hold, handle multiple forms of uh, uh, data. But they have poor support for BI. Complex, they're complex and they lack the enterprise governance tools that most companies need. So what we've done is to merge the strengths of these two approaches into a single platform. We invented this concept and published a white paper on it a year ago, and the concept has really taken off. And we call this the lake house architecture. It gives you the, the ability to build curated data lakes that are reliable, performant, and have the governance you expect from data warehouses directly to your existing data lakes. Bring reliability with acid transactions so that you can be sure that all the operations in the data lake either fully succeed or fail, and then Add the ability to rewind and time travel backward to understand every change made to your data. And since Delta Lake is underpinned by Apache Spark, advanced caching and indexing allows you to process and make queries to data extremely fast and at scale. Finally, Delta Lake provides support for fine-grained access controls, ACLs, to give you much more control over who can access your data in the data lake. The Databricks Lakehouse platform is unique in three ways. First, it's simple. Data only needs to exist once to support all your data workloads on one common platform. It's open. It's based on open source and open standards to make it easy to work with existing tools and avoid proprietary formats and lock-in. And it's collaborative. Your data engineers, your analysts, your data scientists are able to work together much more easily. And this is why we call Databricks the data and AI company. No one else can do what we do with a single solution. What this looks like in retail, when we bring this together, is the retail lake house. And our goal is that you can take data from any source, with any structure or frequency, managed with enterprise class data management features and organized for extremely high performance, to enable all personas are equally served and available across any cloud. So what does this lake house pattern enable us to do? It enables us to deliver use cases our business needs to drive value. We certainly need to satisfy BI reporting, but increasingly businesses want answers. That may be scanning apparel images to extract features for personalization and drive better incrementality or detecting items on the shelf of a grocer maybe measuring sustainability inside our plants or the impact of different supplier options on carbon emissions, the updating inventory in real time for e-commerce or out of stock alerts, performing fine grain forecasting within tight service windows, analyzing transcripts for customer service to identify trends and problems or delivering millions of real time customer engagements. All these very use cases and many more are being solved by Databricks customers today using the Lakehouse pattern. So what do I see next for retail and consumer goods over the next 12 months? I think we're gonna have continued investment in personalization and in inventory and automation. Um, but profitability is a real challenge for retailers as we're seeing slowing growth in 2021. 
Retailers have been investing large amounts in personalization, inventory, allocation, warehouse automation, and external partners to handle ordering and delivery. Um, we have many retailers who have moved to daily forecasting, and they're doing tens of millions of uh, forecasting iterations every single day in response to spikes in demand. Uh, but unfortunately, many of these necessary investments uh, were last minute, and they've left retailers uh, in low or even unprofitable situations. Uh, they were deemed necessary at the time as retailers wanted to capture as much of the surge in market share as possible. But to further complicate things, the growth rate of e-commerce is expected to drop in 2021. Retailers can't bank on making up for the investments with a surge of new customers. And again, one of the biggest challenges uh, retailers are facing right now is with returns. E-commerce is already more expensive as a channel due to increased warehousing, advertising, and fulfillment costs. But many people don't realize that e-commerce has higher rates of return uh, than traditional retailer. And those returns are also more expensive to handle. And this problem is growing. Amazon and Walmart and other companies are using artificial intelligence to decide whether it makes economic sense to process a return for inexpensive items or large items that would incur hefty shipping fees. It's often cheaper to refund the purchase price and just let the customers keep the products. Target gives customers refunds and encourages them to donate or keep the item in a small number of cases in which the company deems that option is easier than returning the purchase. But for anybody who spent more than 30 minutes in retail, you can see the problems that would create. Savvy people will figure out that they can buy things, ask for a return, get the refund, and keep the product. Retail has been at the forefront of innovation throughout mankind. Early writing and math systems were created to enable commerce and record keeping. Now, I love old cash register machines. These gorgeous machines were some of the earliest business systems to automate the collection of data. NCR, or National Cash Register, as it was known at the time, was formed in 1879 to manufacture and sell cash registers. These were the mini computers before we even had electricity. Now, operators would record, read the records nightly from these systems and adjust their books. It was a manual process because it'd be difficult to handle all the adjustments throughout the day from an analog system, but it provided that daily snapshot. One of the largest data warehousing companies in the world partnered with NCR, the same NCR in the 1980s, to create the next generation of database computers, and it was later acquired by NCR. This enabled companies to automate the nightly processing of all the transactions and changes in their systems. But while we've modernized nearly every aspect of our business, and even NCR has evolved to offer many leading technologies. Many of our legacy data operations are still anchored in those design decisions from decades ago. E-commerce, omnichannel, delivery, and more place requirements that make these legacy approaches insufficient. We live in a 24 by 7 by 365 world, and we need data systems that support that. Why is this important? Well, when we load data in batches, we create windows between when an event happens and when an accurate decision can be made. The further we get away from the moment of time when an action occurs, the greater the likelihood for a problem to occur. One of the hottest areas of investment by Databricks retail customers right now is in rebuilding their data processing to use event-driven architecture with Delta. This allows them to provide real-time data with clickstream, T-log, and inventory information to power their decisions. So how does this translate into business value? Well, let's look at issues with e-commerce fulfillment in this scenario. We know that e-commerce has higher costs to fulfill and higher rates of return. I like to order my groceries and have them delivered. I use a variety of retailers. I can't show favoritism. But there's one app that's used by a few grocers. Even though the app tells me that I can make changes up to 24 hours before delivery, I know that in reality, I can't really make changes. When I've tried to make adjustments in the past, I've had duplicate orders delivered, missing items, and other problems. 
it's a horrible customer experience. And furthermore, it costs the retailer a lot of money. But for our customers who have moved to a real-time event-driven architecture, they can accept my order, provide me accurate information on item availability in real-time, make adjustments if I change my mind, and all before the order is picked and shipped. Instead of paying to deliver a problem, problematic order to me, they prevent the issue before it leaves their doors. Where does real-time have the greatest impact? Well, recommendations built on real-time data have much higher conversion. Perpetual inventory is quite literally the definition of real-time. And nothing frustrates a customer like ordering something that they were told was in stock, only to be told later that it wasn't available. Order consolidation and order picking uh, optimization go directly to the bottom line of retailers. And fraud detection has the potential to be a major factor. Individual fraud events cost retailers millions of dollars each year. And the moment a vulnerability is known, it's shared. One of the best ways to minimize fraud is to limit the time window for exposures by improving the speed of our response. Another major investment area for retailers and consumer goods is in sustainability. Databricks has been leading data and AI innovation and sustainability for years. It's an important issue for us. We recently held a sustainability forum with leaders from across leading uh, sustainability organizations. Beyond that, our customers are using our thought leadership and leveraging free tools that we have published to create index funds, improve efficiency, and make better decisions today on sustainability. And I'm proud to say that we're dragging the industry forward. Our competitors have increased their mentions of ESG and sustainability by 57% just in the past 90 days. Now, some say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, but we don't mind. While we don't like vendor lock-in, we're all locked in on this planet together, and anything that we can do to improve is good. So we'll continue to invest in sustainability and encourage our industry to do more. Uh, be sure to follow us, though, uh, for continued thought leadership and innovation in this area. And what do I see further out on the horizon? I make predictions each year at Summit on what I think is on the horizon for retail. I'm over a 90% accuracy rate on my predictions. In my secret, I cheat. We're actively working with customers in all but one use case that's listed here. What am I most excited about? Well, I think next generation personalization that enables customers to try outfits on from home or to match the fit is really interesting. I think drone delivery is going to be a game changer. We have a customer, Zipline, who is already doing drone delivery of life-saving medicines in Africa via autonomous drones in less than 30 minutes. Uh, you can go check out databricks.com or YouTube, go search for Zipline for a video of their story. It's well worth a watch. You know, one of the best things about working at Databricks is that if you're working on a moonshot for tomorrow, there's a good chance a customer is running it in their production today. And before I wrap up, I want to make people aware of free tools that Databricks provides to, to our customers to help them accelerate their journey with data and AI. First, our solution accelerators, which may be our most popular program. More on this in just a second. We also have a world-class business value organization that helps companies build business cases, map value, and prioritize their roadmap to accelerate their realization of value from data and AI. Now, while data and AI is the largest event that we organize, we also host executive summits, industry forums, and hundreds of other meetups, webinars, and other events throughout the year. Again, check out databricks.com for the latest here. Doing data and AI can be hard. It requires understanding the business problem, current methods, and design patterns on how to solve the problem. In some cases, people don't even know if a problem is possible. As Databricks has worked with thousands of customers across a variety of industries, we've noticed recurring business common business problems. You know, some of these include, how do I better predict demand for my products? or what products should I recommend to a customer to increase sales? Solution accelerators were created to help show our customers how they can solve these business problems with data and AI and provide them with a solid foundation from which to build full solutions. 
What they aren't, they're not full solutions. They're accelerators. They're not black boxes. They're not proprietary solutions. Solution accelerators are fully functional, fast starts that demonstrate how you can ingest data from a wide variety of sources in batch or streaming, transform and prepare that data for analysis, inspect the data, develop and test models, and deploy the output to downstream systems. Beyond just educating customers, these are a foundation from which companies can accelerate their own timelines. Solution accelerators are built on extensive research and development and leverage leading and emerging practices in the areas of data engineering and data scientists. They've been optimized to take full advantage of the performant nature of Databricks. Now we have nearly 40 current solution accelerators that are available for free today. And there are many more in active development. Go check out databricks.com. You can read blog posts on these, download the notebooks into your environment, watch video walkthroughs and more. Some additional resources, if you want to learn more or stay up to date on the latest retail news at Databricks, check out these. First, the Databricks blog is the best place to get a wide range of information. New products, features, updates, and solution accelerators. Secondly, we just launched the Retail Forward blog on Medium. Go to medium.com slash retail dash forward and give us a follow. We'll be diving deeper into a range of topics and even welcoming guest posts from customers. So please give us a follow. And lastly, you can follow me on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the first place that I post new announcements. With that, I want to thank you for your time today, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you, Rob. That was great. Now it's time for our esteemed group of speakers representing some of the biggest global brands in retail, grocery, and consumer goods to engage in a thoughtful panel discussion. Back to you, Rob, to introduce our speakers and kick off the panel. Thank you for joining us. I have the privilege of introducing the STEAM panel of experts from across all areas of retail and consumer goods. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists today for joining us. Uh, joining us today, we have Colleen Q. Uh, she's head of data science at Albertsons. Deepak Jose uh, works at Mars, leads business strategy and analytics. Errol Kuhlmeister uh, works at H&M, head of the AI, AI Foundation. Robert Barham works at Gusto and director of data there. And lastly, Alberto Rossi, Shell Global Head of Retail Data and Analytics. I've known many of you and certainly your work, and I've been looking forward to this session for months. Colleen, Jose, uh, Deepak, Errol, Robert, Alberto, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so let's begin. Retailers are at a major inflection point. COVID hit the industry hard last year and in different ways by category. Some categories such as grocery saw a massive surge of customers and had to respond to the demands of serving e-commerce spikes. Other categories struggled as consumer trends and movement slowed. Consumer goods companies also saw similar challenges as consumer demand became unpredictable. Brands that had strong on-premise sales struggled, but direct-to-consumer exploded. And to further complicate things, we threw most of our predictive models out of the door last year. We're still suffering the effects of COVID in many parts of the world. And so while some countries are seeing an end to it, it is by no means an equal recovery. Uh, this has been the most challenging 18 months possibly in modern history for retail, rivaled only by World Wars or the 1918 flu. So Alberto, beginning with you, um, Shell has one of the largest global retail footprints on the planet, operating in 80 countries. How successful were you in being able to predict where COVID was going to hit and what lessons did you learn from this? Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob. And uh, first of all, many thanks for having me uh, today at the summit. We're so very proud for being here with so many uh, data leaders sitting here with me. Uh, as you said, Shell uh, Retail is operating in more than 80 markets globally through more than 46,000 sites and uh, is serving about 30 million customers a day. So this gave us a unique uh, chance to understand what was happening at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly in China, where we have um, about nine GVs. So if we go back in our mind in January and February, it was so important to understand the effect of this uh, virus on life, on society, on businesses, and we were able to use real-time data from China to understand the effect on volumes, on fuel volumes, on shop sales, 
but also something that we were particularly keen was to understand the speed of recovery. So how quick was the recovery? At the same time, because I'm based in Italy, was uh, was for me um, very important to to really see COVID-19 in real person. So I saw really, uh, because I'm based in Milan, uh, I saw the spread of the virus uh, uh, in Europe for, um, for the first time. And for me, it was important at the time to understand the key metrics to use uh, during the pandemic, understanding the cases, total cases, number of people in ICUs, people hospitalized. And we all know that these data were not very reliable, but these really were the data used by many governments to close and reopen businesses, school, uh, public transport. So we actually use with data because also there was not much else to, to use to understand how the pandemic was, was uh, actually progressing. Forecasting was very difficult, I have to say, but we also saw a pretty similar curve in Italy, in Spain, in France, with a bit of delay in terms of weeks, or for example, the UK, that has a similar curve, but just three weeks, with a delay of three weeks. For us, uh, was really important to leverage our, uh, our data that we have stored in, uh, in a platform called Data House. It's a single platform with real-time transactions from more than 23,000 sites. We are reliable and, uh, and trusted data. So for us, it was important to provide to leadership a really clear understanding of what was happening on, on sites. Also, uh, fuel volumes has been used, for example, as a great proxy to understand uh, the speed um, and to spot the signal of recovery. For example, we have also used data from Google, from Apple on mobility, but we have really leveraged a lot more our internal data because fuel is really a proxy to see if mobility is really uh, moving up or not. Uh, so we actually, we didn't really need a lot of external uh, data. Internally then was also a chance to understand more uh, um, how the customer were changing their, their habits, their needs. If we think about the lockdown, of course, needs were very different. And Shell operates about 7,000 uh, convenience stores selling about $6 billion per year. So we really use the data uh, to spot very quickly uh, the evolution of customer needs, uh, so buying more groceries, buying more perishable, um, buying more through e-commerce. So we had some alliances with delivery, with food delivery, like Food Panda, Deliveroo, and other local players. So for us, uh, wrapping up was, uh, was very important to provide real-time information, both to the front line but also to the leadership, make them really understand what was going on uh, in the different markets and in different uh, regions, because not all the regions in a specific market has reacted the same. And, um, and also making sure we were um, providing trusted data, because at the time, really, the important part was to create clarity rather than confusion. So it sounds like a lot of real-time information I like the idea of the proxies, the proxies by looking at the different countries and even the, the, the diesel fuel as a great surrogate indicator for, for what may be coming. Um, Deepak, you've got a similar uh, type of challenge in terms of a global supply chain. It extends all around the planet, uh, and but you have different challenges, right? We've got uh, port blockages, warehouse constraints, and more. In addition to all the COVID challenges, what has Mars learned uh, going through all this? Thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. I think uh, I'll, it's a great opportunity for all of us to learn from each other and um, take our practices further in the area of data science. If uh, we were in person, I would have started by giving you all some M&Ms and Snickers. So uh, I'll save it for the next time we meet in person. Um, Rob, you were spot on uh, with the aspect that the global uh, nature of our business at Mars. If we think about the digital transformation at Mars, even before pandemic, it was moving at a huge pace. I think now, uh, especially since the pandemic, uh, the digital transformation is on steroids. A lot of different activities 
I have seen personally in the team which I operate in, our work streams have quadrupled uh, with uh, the senior leadership across Mars uh, seeking for more and more involvement with analytics in driving decision making. Now, depending on which business unit of Mars you talk about, uh, the impact has been different. Uh, now, Mars Pet Care, which is one the, our largest segment, which includes both pet nutrition and pet hospitals. Pet nutrition brands like uh, Pedigree, Whiskers, Royal Canin are some of the brands there. Now, what we have learned uh, from the pet business, the pet nutrition and pet care, see, all of us are sitting at home, uh, not meeting our loved ones in the to the extent that so. One positive thing that we have seen, there is a record number of adoptions of pets. Um, we have seen some of the uh, biggest growth rates ever in the history of the business, especially on pet adoption. That means it's a huge tailwind to the pet nutrition, pet food category. Uh, but on the similar thing on the food business for our rice brands or the pasta brands, the business is uh, in a very good shape. When you think about our confectionery business, uh, the chocolate and confectionery, where the brands like m and Snickers, Dow Chocolate would belong, and, and the chewing gum business, there has been an impact on, our, uh, on the transaction side of the business. So think about um, uh, any kind of products which sits on the checkout counter. I think uh, we have seen some headwinds, even uh, the consumers are thinking about their safety before picking something up from the transaction zone. So the kind of business have evolved uh, in the Mars Wrigley or the chocolate and confectionery category. At Mars, we use something called Mars Digital Engine to drive any problem, which is a very important part of uh, our digital transformation. It's a simple four step process. We tell, you have to find the problem using user centricity and design thinking. You should solve the problem using AI and machine learning. Then once you solve it, create value, then you automate using robotics process automation to unlock the resource. And all of these three process, it has to go through an agile delivery process. But in our simple words, what we tell, if you want to move from point A to point B, you don't need a Ferrari. Uh, you just need a skateboard. Now that agility has helped us, uh, especially uh, in the challenges with supply chain. Uh, we were able to take in more data sources to improve the forecasting uh, to a great extent. We were able to, uh, the, omni ch the channels are going through significant shift. The omni-channel shift is very significant for us at Mars. So, the agility uh, helped us quite a bit in solving for the new norm, uh, as I would say. So I'm, I'm hearing a common theme between you and Alberto, um, where it's really not as much about alternative data sets or external information as much as it is speed and agility became the really key factors to help you really respond to this. Um, uh, Errol, Colleen, Robert. Robert, I know with um, uh, with Gusto that speed's a big factor for you. Anything that you've learned with Gusto that you want to add on to this? Yeah, I think so. We had similar experiences. And I think with Gusto, we were quite fortunate in that being in food and being in online food, we found that actually the challenge for us was really one of how do we fulfill the demand that we're seeing? which already was forecast to grow quite a lot last year, but obviously accelerated a lot as we went into the first lockdown in the UK. So I think for us, the agility was really critical. It was how do we take our data teams combined with other cross-functional groups of team members, software engineers, others, and how do we think quite quickly about how we can support the operation in that scaling? And scaling was, was quite critical. It was at the level of, if we're on our current trajectory, we may not be able to ship boxes for the demand that we're seeing. So for us, I think actually, probably the most important aspect was how we tried to act creatively and thinking about new approaches to solve problems. So for example, we looked at our existing factory, we looked at the new factory we were bringing online and saw that that was several months away. 
And we tried to think differently about how we could configure our lines in our first factory. So could we configure them more asymmetrically? And we would kind of simulate different line configurations and see what would grow the throughput in our factory in a way we hadn't really done before, but we had the skill sets in the ingredients, but we hadn't used them in quite that way. That was one really powerful example for us. And even thinking beyond that, we would look at our menu, how we design our menu, what SKUs we have on it, and try and come up with ways to maximize variety while minimizing SKU diversity in such a way that we can reduce complexity and grow throughput in our operation, all of which we had the data products to do. It was just kind of using them in a way that would support us with that. So that was key for us. It was really, you know, how do we approach that situation and think quite creatively and think a bit differently as a data team, because often data teams, you sometimes work on quite slow cycles. This was much faster for us and really responding to events as they happened in real time. So yeah, that for us was really important. Excellent. Um, so that was a pretty serious topic for us to begin with. Uh, let's shift gears to something a little bit lighter. AI is changing all aspects of our industry, uh, from automated warehouse to product line optimization, like Robert was just talking about, uh, and digital twins to drone delivery, AI personalization that helps people imagine how clothing looks like on them. Um, which brings me to Errol. Um, Errol, I read your posts on LinkedIn all the time. You're a great thought leader in the industry. I encourage everybody to go find you on LinkedIn and to follow you. Um, what's an, uh, an area of innovation in AI that has you excited and how far out do you think that is? So I thank you, Rob, for, for having me. First of all, it, it's a great pleasure being here and speaking with you as always. Uh, I think some of the, the things we're coming to see more and more now is on the topic of edge AI. And that's actually getting me really, really excited. Uh, of course, we're spending a lot of time right now on personalization, hyper-personalization, uh, the traditional, for me now, streaming events into our websites. But as soon as we can start pushing personalization out on edge devices into stores, et cetera, we're going to see the next level of personalization. These type of topics, in, in my point of view, are still early days. And we're discussing both on an infrastructure type of level, how is it going to look, where are we doing computation, how are we going to store the data, uh, all the way down to how the device is going to interact. Uh, so edge AI are, are the type of topics that get me really excited today. Uh, I really like the notion that everybody wants to feel like a rock star, not potentially being a rock star. That's another topic, but feeling like one. When you get into the store, everybody's going to treat like, like they, they know what you need. They're going to pay full attention to you and you're going to get exactly the things that you need. AI is the great enabler of that type of feeling. Edge AI is when we're starting to get that really close to you. You shouldn't have to be just in front of your laptop or your mobile device. It should be integrated into everything that we do. So take our physical retail stores. We're having mirrors in there. Could you personalize them with your, your approval, of course? Could you personalize the clothing, the pricing, everything to make the experience explicit and fully personalized for you as an individual? These type of topics when we're discussing today, they, they really get me going and getting the brain juice flowing is really about how do we enable that? Because the easy part is imagining, the hard part is executing on these type of topics. So back to the topics that how do we make sure that the data is there in time? How do we make sure that computational patterns are identified, architecture, et cetera? So these are the type of things that, that keeps me up at night. And these are the type of things I want to implement in, in retail to make sure our customer has the best possible experience out there. I love it. And you, it's actually, you gave a great segue. Um, talking about rock stars. Uh, Colleen, most people will know Albertsons for explosive e-commerce growth this past year. Uh, your team's been at the center of that, but you also spent several years at Tesla. So you certainly have the credentials uh, on being on the leading edge of, of innovation. What has you excited uh, about retail and AI? Yeah, thank you, Rob. First of all, uh, also thank you for inviting me here. Um, so what excites me is actually if I look out for 10 years, think about the future of retail and the grocery or how food is being served to customers. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking about you know, you will see Tesla full self-driving trucks in your neighborhood delivering groceries. And there will be so many options for customers to place orders. That's different from today that you're solely placing your orders online or in your mobile app. So imagining that you can probably talk to your fridge 
through voice command. You see what's in it, and you you will want to order your next uh, grocery order. And you can also potentially place the order while you are in a virtual space playing games. Um, and then lastly, of course, you can go to the many more potentially available human list stores, uh, if you will, right? There will be the traditional stores, but there's likely to be more human list stores where AI and the data will play a central role to enable that capability. So for me, I think the future is very exciting in retail and in grocery. And uh, what we do today is, you know, really setting the foundations for the future of, you know, what will happen in 10 years. So uh, I think to Arrow's point, my team here in Albertsons in the last year, we also worked on many projects that relates to how do we personalize digital shopping experience? How do we personalize marketing messaging, marketing campaigns, loyalty incentives? Uh, how do we even also leverage AI and the machine learning to um, making our e-commerce fulfillment operation more efficient and more effective? Um, outside of that, I think if you think about traditional retail, I think it's also a huge playground for data scientists uh, and the data. So for example, we, my team here, we work with our supply chain team, merchandising team, pricing promotion team, um, our store operating team, as well as even our human resource team to apply AI and to solve different problems uh, for the different use cases there. So um, for me, I think there's a lot of innovation ahead of us and going back to data and AI, those are you know, really crucial in the future of how everything is going to be shaped up. And uh, um, in terms of personally, uh, what's excite me today um, one is really also about deep learning. There's so many new things happening every single day on deep learning. How do we, you know, apply deep learning to solve some of the real world problem? Mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting. Um, the other area is on ro robotics, right? So uh, in Albertsons, we are partnering with uh, robot, robot companies on delivery. Uh, we also have MFCs, our micro fulfillment center that's robotic and powered. So for me, that's another key area that's very exciting that's that's happening currently. So, you know, it, it's it's interesting. You're you're talking about these um things like the first of all, a couple common themes are coming up. The speed, the edge, um, the robotics. If I were to put you on a spot, because I we we work with quite a few firms that are doing the drone delivery test. In fact, we have a great a uh, uh, customer of ours that is today um, Zipline is doing delivery of critical medicines in Africa within 30 minutes. So they got this, this drone that flies. It's fascinating to, to watch. Um, how far off are we really from having more than pilots? And in, in, if I'm going to put you on the spot to make a prediction, like one year, three years, where do you think we're at for drone delivery? Um, I think a drone delivery uh, is probably faster than the full self-driving. Um, so I, I would think a drone delivery in my mind could happen in the ne next uh, probably 18 months or so. Oh, wow, that early. Um, Alberto, uh, making the transition from uh, electronic vehicles, um, Shell's doing incredible work transforming your stations to be ready for uh, EVs and creating new ways to engage customers in those journeys. Um, what excites you about AI, what's coming and, and how you're rethinking the, the, the shell stores? Yeah, exactly, Rob. Of course, are very exciting uh, times in the retail organization. We are also changing name, we will be called mobility. Yeah, shell is, um, is really leading what we call the energy transition and the business uh, decarbonization. So a lot of businesses need to decarbonize in the next uh, years. And also Shell has a target to meet zero emission by 2015. So it's a very, uh, a very big, uh, big target. And um, as a result, of course, uh, Shell is investing a lot in the new mobility, as you said, like uh, EV chargers. Just to give you an example, last week was announced uh, the first hub, recharge hub in the city center of Paris. But actually, there are just rechargers and there, are no, there is no fuel at all. So of course, for a company like Shell that has been uh, managing and selling fuel for more than 100 years, this is quite, uh, it's quite exciting, but also challenging. For, from a data point of view, it's also exciting because data is really at the center 
of, uh, of the transition. If we think about the need uh, of, um, of a customer driving uh, an electric car compared to, to a fuel car, uh, these are completely different. But also uh, from an engineering point of view, uh, having to deal with fuel is one thing, with electrons is something completely different. So we really need to work on the data literacy in the company. So making sure people understand this, what is actually for us a new business and make an example. So nobody's really interested how long does it take to refuel your uh, fossil fuel car. Usually it takes two, three minutes. It's the same for all car. So it can last a bit more or less depending on the size of the tank. Uh, but an electric car is completely different. So it depends on the speed of a recharger, on the grid, the availability of electricity at that specific time of, of the day, it depends on the car, it depends on a lot of things. So this is why data are so, are so critical. And also it's very important to know where you can recharge your car, uh, if it's free or if it's busy. Uh, so these are all the things and insights that are actually data driven. Then we need to understand the customer, the customer needs. Are they, are the customers stopping more or less uh, at our site? Are they, buy, they buying more or less in uh, in the shop? Because uh, you know when you refuel your car, it takes two three minutes and then you go. Uh, recharging uh, a car, of course, it takes a lot more. It takes usually an average of 30 minutes. So what do you do during that time? Usually you spend time in the shop and are you buying more premium products? Are you buying completely different products? Are you buying more promotion? Are you more price sensitive? So these are all the questions that the business has. So very, very exciting because really I see data at the, at the center. So we are really working on uh, building the foundation. So bringing all these new data into our data house but also leveraging, in this case, also machine learning, because it's not just about generating insight, but also leveraging uh, machine learning, for example, to understand where to have the next wave of uh, rechargers, uh, in which location, in which part of the city, city center, or on the go on, uh, on motorways. And these are all things we need, we need to know. Uh, there is not really, nobody really is an expert. Uh, here. And also we are having new competitors, for example, if you think Tesla, Tesla was not a competitor before, now for us is actually a competitor because they're building their own, uh, their own rechargers and uh, their own uh, lounge on the sides. So data really at, at the center of, um, of this uh, transition. Um, also here, real-time data, of course, very important, but also leveraging machine learning and, um, and on this one, I think it was good, the choice of Shell and Mobility to create this analytics app that we have with 70 data scientists because we are seeing more and more projects on EVs uh, compared to the past. Because Shell also announced um, a few weeks ago that we will move from 60,000 to half a million recharges by 2025. It is actually just uh, four years, even less. So it's, uh, it's really a lot. So it's very critical to, to make it this right in the next uh, month. That's incredible. Um, so just, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just stunned. Half a million, that's an absolutely incredible investment. Um, so speaking of investments here, um, we saw in the past 18 months or so, uh, a significant investment in many areas of uh, um, of retail and uh, with a lot of companies really doubled down on personalization as we saw market share grow, right? Uh, they wanted to capture the, the, the consumers. Real-time inventory systems to be able to meet the needs, especially in traditional physical retail, um, where the only avenue for serving was within um, uh, the, the e-commerce space uh, and just general capabilities to enable e-commerce, um, curbside pickup, delivery, et cetera. And I think these investments have worked for most of us as we saw the market share surge. Uh, but unfortunately, the reality with e-commerce is that it is a more expensive channel to serve than physical retail. Uh, we have higher advertising costs. We have higher warehousing costs. We have increased costs from order picking and delivery, higher rates of return, and more expensive processes for dealing with returns. Um, so these costs are placing challenges on companies, especially as we have markets that were, are returning back to whatever the new normal is, and, and that may reduce the amount that's uh, being served uh, in e-commerce. Um, 
Robert, beginning with you, you're serving thousands and thousands of customer orders each week, um, each picked with fresh materials and the possibility to run out of stock or have other challenges. What has Gusto done to reduce those costly problems in fulfilling orders? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we've had a, a couple of challenges we've had to tackle in the last year in particular. One was the one I mentioned before on just how do we serve the volumes growing at the rate that they were last year. But I think to your point, there's also a question on how, especially in the world of fresh ingredients, do we manage to fulfill orders with the quality level we aspire to when we're operating at that kind of scale, opening new sites, expanding and so on. So I think for us in the data team, it's really been a mix of techniques. It's, it's actually been a mix of quite high tech and quite low tech in some ways. So I think on the side of the higher tech aspects, we've tried to develop and make use of our data products to help us meet the kind of quality aspirations that we have. So for example, I mentioned before, we, we have what we call data-driven menu. We design our menus algorithmically. So each week when a customer sees recipes on the website, we can select from a pool of thousands of recipes and we're using algorithms to optimize and create the most appropriate menu for that week. Now, a lot of that is and has been about how we create the best customer experience, what the right level of variety is on a given menu. But we've also adapted those algorithms so they could do things like um, down weight skews that may be more likely to have a quality error over the past few weeks, if we've maybe seen a particular supplier having more challenges, for example. So it's an example of kind of a novel use of an algorithm we had already. Similarly, forecasting has been hugely important for us as for everyone else. Being able to use new forecasting techniques, mature our forecasts, get to a level where we're ever more accurate and less error prone on particular forecast lines has been tremendously important as we scale. I'd say that also the low tech has been important. So a lot of what we do is algorithmic and really about how we use data creatively. But I think also what's worked well for us is when we have to respond quite quickly, thinking about also not just what data products and AI products are important, but what insight can we provide to our decision makers so they can ever more effectively create a stable operation in a given week if we're facing some challenges. So an example of that, I mean, we, we set up um, some simply more advanced reports that would showcase where we're seeing issues on SKUs in a given week or period of time. And we'd set up sessions with our food team to just review our menus and see if we want to iterate at all with the manual adjustments we do based on the data we're seeing coming through, which sounds crude and, and is and does flow into data products, but actually in, in the time frame that you're operating in with these cycles, that can be quite powerful as well. So for us, it was that, it was that mixture of kind of low tech, how do we provide data in the best way we can to make decisions? And then how do we loop back to iterate and improve our data products to help create the kind of stability we need in a time where there's a lot of volatility in the market, certainly in the supply chain that we're dealing with. Yeah, sometimes you don't need to over-engineer it. Sometimes the crude reports um, are certainly uh, as effective as, or if not more than some of the more advanced or nuanced algorithms. Um, by the way, I'm gonna put a plug in for Gusto on Medium. Your data engineering blog out there is one of the ones that I read uh, religiously. So uh, for everybody, go out to Medium and check out Gusto on there uh, and definitely do a follow there. Um, Colleen, uh, same question for you. What type of data and AI capabilities can grocers? I mean, you're, that's probably the most impacted uh, segment of retail, I think, from the, the, the profitability aspect with the investments and the additional cost of serve and everything. How should grocers uh, uh, think about data and AI and what can they introduce to help them better control our costs? Uh, yes, so my team here, uh, we spend our um, time on sol solving three types of problems. Number one, I think is the uh, similar theme as Robert, like what we focus on is better forecasting and the planning. And I think going back to the, you know, the question is that the, um, the cost is surging as you're growing your e-commerce. And I think there actually, uh, there is a problem related to the economic of scale, right? Um, it's costly at this moment because e-commerce in grocery retail is still single digit as of total, the omni-channel experience, right? So as the e-commerce grow, as we have more volume, actually, I believe AI and the machine learning can create a more efficiency in our end-to-end -end operations for e-commerce. So in the future, once e-commerce is at a scale, there is a possibility it actually can be less costly than running a traditional brick and mortar store. So understand that is also important because we work on the other two type of problem. Uh, one is on automation, right? Where can we see that human efforts can be saved 
by leveraging machine learning. So a lot of opportunity in our business in terms of automation. How do, where do we use a system? Where do we use a computer, use algorithm to help make decisions rather than relying on humans um, from time to time? I think that there's a huge opportunity there. And then the last area that we work on is uh, optimization. So for e-commerce uh, fulfillment and operations, there are many problems that are related to operation research. And there are many problems that we're applying in algorithms to help optimizing. So for uh, one example, like uh, relates to one project right now we're working on is how do we better sequencing our orders uh, that we're picking, the pickers are picking. How do we figure out the better picking route for pickers in the store when multiple orders are coming in? How do we help making better decisions on which order should go into batching, which order should stay as an individual pick. So those uh, three areas, going back to planning, automation, and optimizations, these are the three areas that my team involve on working with our business and to figure out how we can help drive down the cost of running e-commerce. One, and I would think that that's an especially challenging question on the optimization side. Uh, because not only do you have optimization of, of pickers and consulting, then you have other factors of anticipated arrival time, the freshness of the food. You've got a bunch of other factors that come into play. Is that is that fair? That is very fair. Yeah. So uh, we designed a simulation solution, a simulator for you know testing our sequencing algorithm, and uh, we certainly have to be very mindful of okay, what's the current situation, and what parameter can we hold a study, and what parameter are we playing with, trying to optimize the order, the sequencing of the orders. So there's a lot of like a business, not, you know, communication and understanding the moving factors, the rather more stable factors so that we can pick and choose, build the right simulator for our sequencing algorithm. Interesting. Uh, okay, so so switching um, to the, the last topic that we wanted to cover today, um, nearly every company on the planet has made sustainability a major focus at the sea level. Uh, and investment firms are further signaling that they'll evaluate potential firms to invest in based on their environmental, social, uh, and governance, or ESG scores. Sustainability isn't new to retail and consumer goods. Um, waste goes to bottom line. Uh, I worked in beer for eight years. We were obsessed with reducing the amount of water that we used, whether it was in the fields or in the brewery. Restaurants and grocers care about food waste. All of us care about ethically sourced materials and products. Errol, sustainability is one of the most important objectives at H&M. Uh, it's also difficult to measure and to make informed decisions. How is H&M using data and AI to improve their sustainability initiatives? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, it, it's a very good question. And let me just start with saying it, it's time for reinvention. I think fashion and design enrich our lives, lifting us from the everyday, providing style and identity. Uh, but as you said, our industry faces urgent challenges such as climate change, water and resource scarcity and the need for greater equality globally. Uh, these are some of the most important topic for, for us as a company. Uh, we, are decided, we have decided to take the lead. Uh, we're pioneering the search for new solutions, utilizing our size and, and global presence to catalyze the transformation of our industry. Uh, we wanna speed up the change, we wanna do it faster, and we wanna embrace sustainability as the, the core of this company. We're doing it through uh, three different pillars. One is being fair and equal, uh, we want to do circular and climate positive company, and we want to be leading the change. Uh, you asked about AI, and that's all about leading the change. We have from day one with our AI initiative seen the positive effects that AI can have. Uh, for instance, doing forecasting. Forecasting the right things means that we produce the right things at the right moment, minimizing the waste. We only want to produce the things we actually sell. We want to make sure that we personalize the experience and we want to invest more in uh, a circular economy. So AI and data is the core at all of our decision making. We're also now looking into how can we track this? How can we have metrics associated with AI to make sure that our carbon footprints actually have a, a decline? We all know that building AI model is extremely expensive from a CO2 perspective. We want to be able to track that as well to make sure that we design smart architectures from a data perspective that minimizes this waste as well. So when you ask me about what we're doing with sustainability and AI, I would say it's at the core of everything we do. 
sustainability and responsible AI as well. And we're developing internal frameworks to make sure that the things we do, we produce are not just good from a sustainability perspective, but from an ethical and responsibility perspective as well. So I would say it's one of the most important topics we have of 2021. Do you think, um, by the way, I, you, you mentioned we could have a whole separate conversation on uh, a responsible AI and the announcements the EU made, I think, last week or the week before on how that's going to be a major focus, I think, similar to GDPR. But um, back on sustainability, I'm, I'm curious. One of the challenges that we've seen is um, we, we call it from suite to, to site. Uh, it's a C-suite initiative, but often it's difficult for people making the daily decisions to understand what the impact is uh, of their decisions on meeting the sustainability initiatives. You think about like the, the cost of carbon. Um, yep. Do you think that uh, um, are we going to start assigning costs to energy to, to more economic costs other than just the, the per unit cost? Is that the direction you think that we'll see in these rate to, to like the total cost of, of items? Like if I buy something that's shipped on a boat from China versus something that I'm buying from Spain to, to, to bring into to Sweden, obviously there's a, a much higher uh, carbon output for shipping it halfway around the world. Do you think that starts to get factored in? Oh, oh, definitely. And we're already looking into it. I mean, certain of our brands, remembering um, H&M groups, it's not just H&M brand, have right. already deployed uh, these type of solutions where you're able to track the, the type of fabrics you're having in the clothes, where they come from, uh, the cost of actually shipping it over here. So you get a full footprint of your garments so you can make informed decisions. It's look, just like reading the ingredients of, of any food that you're eating. We want that to be possible for the clothes and the fashion that we're producing as well. So it's all about the consumers, educating them, making sure that the choices they make uh, can be based on best practices. So we want to push for more transparency in the industry as well. Excellent. Uh, Deepak, same question for you. I, I know Mars is deeply invested in sustainability. Uh, how is data and AI playing a role in helping Mars accomplish its objectives uh, in this space? Absolutely. Uh, see, um, the, uh, at Mars, we think about sustainability uh, in few different ways. And uh, it is very important for us to think about not only profit, it is about people, pet, and our planet uh, as well. So you will see uh, that is embedded in the ways of working and wherever it is possible. There are few aspects which I want to uh, talk about uh, regarding sustainability. Now, one area which we launched very recently is on the coral reef restoration plan, uh, which is tagged with one of our pet care, uh, pet nutrition brand called Sheba. So I think if you guys have not taken a look, I think uh, this is uh, one of the initiatives very recently launched, uh, sponsored by Mars with strong support from uh, the MLT with a lot of uh, partnership from the industry as well on how to restore the coral reef, which is very important. Uh, that is one of the several initiatives Mars is uh, leading in partnership uh, with several governmental agencies on uh, doing something really close and well with the for the planet. Another aspect which I want to bring from a futuristic standpoint uh, you asked this question about uh, AI and uh, machine learning, how it is going to uh, help. There is this team within Mars called the Mars Advanced Research Institute. And their key task is to use AI and machine learning to help become Mars more sustainable uh, across different aspects. It can be on the ingredients of the, of a lot of our nutrition products that we are building, how can we have uh, the right data ingested to take the right scenario planning to decide what is the right futuristic product that should be there. So there are a list of these kind of initiatives which that team is leading, Mars Advanced Research Institute. And uh, third, personally, one of my favorite area where I think uh, uh, Mars will be able to make a significant impact, which is one of our uh, global corporate initiatives on sustainable packaging. Um, as you know, uh, uh, even uh, before joining Mars, my stint at Coca-Cola, I've seen sustainable packaging uh, is a huge area where 
uh, large global manufacturers can make a difference. Uh, the right kind of packaging, if you break, uh, I mean, if you bring, I think that is going to make a huge difference. So that is that is some of the examples what I've seen at Mars and uh, in the industry as well, where data and AI uh, is making a huge impact. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the, um, the, the the part about understanding from like basically from source to use. And uh, it, we're seeing a, a, a common trend across customers to have this um, lineage, so to speak, of individual ingredients, individual items that go into a product to be able to trace that through. And it would seem that, you know, they, we're kind of at, at this beautiful period in, in, in retail and consumer goods and that that the scale of the, the data that was that's involved in, in tracking that to know that, you know, this individual item that I have here is constituted of all these independent things that all came from fields or different sources within there. I mean, the primary use case that I've heard for this is to look at things like product recall to be more effective at what I pull off the shelf in the instance there. But it sounds like you're thinking it may be something where we can even look at it to to monitor those economic costs, to look at sustainability throughout the entire life cycle of that product from the ind independent ingredients all the way down to uh, to where it's consumed. Is that fair? Yeah, so I think um, a great point, Rob. I think uh, my hope is in every decisions that we take on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure that the time uh, is there and the, we have the data and infrastructure currently within not only Mars, within all the organizations to mm -hmm. take that call. And I, I think it is not a uh, nice to have as an option, but I think it is a must have uh, in the way every organization should think about and especially in the area of sustainability. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that uh, hopefully I, we see more industry collaboration around this to, to better factor these in, because I think Errol said it right. It's now is the time to reinvent the industry around sustainability. Uh, so lastly, I'll ask you all one more thing. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, you've had terrific input and, and uh, comments today. What's one website, author, or resource that you'd encourage people to go check out where you stay up to date on things? Um, Colleen, I'll start with you. What do you read to stay current? Uh, one of my favorite sites is openai.com. Uh, most recently, I've been looking into a lot of GPT-3 use cases. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Deepak? I'll go back to you. Oh, great question. I mean, I think Colin, you, you, I, I, I can promise like that was the exact thing that I was thinking. <laughs> but let me talk about something on the CPG uh, as well. So I'm listening to a lot of different podcasts, um, uh, which is uh, on the omni-channel trends. So cpgguys.com, uh, it's led by uh, a couple of uh, CPG experts, but I've seen excellent uh, participation from the industry. Uh, different manufacturers, retailers coming and talking that. So, uh, and I would recommend a podcast which which uh, uh, I'm uh, quite enjoying these days. Nice. I haven't heard of the CPG guys. I'm going to check them out. Um, Errol, who do you check out uh, to to stay current? Well, you, Rob, of course. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but other than that, I'm an algorithmic type of person. Uh, so I tend to go to the sites like, like Medium, read a few articles, and actually trust some of the, uh, the recommendations they give me. Uh, and on top of that, building on, I, I like to listen in on, on podcasts uh, to different speakers and listening to experiences. And then when my, my bookshelf is uh, empty, I like to, to ask on LinkedIn. Uh, so, I mean, as you said in the beginning, uh, connect with me, connect with all of us, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask you for, for advice myself and give advice as well, of course. Love it. Uh, Robert, I, I already mentioned uh, uh, the Gusto blog is one of the ones that I go to to read, um, but what do you read to stay on top of things? Yeah, so for me, it's very similar to Errol, actually. So it's it's a mix of things. I think there's always good content coming up on LinkedIn. I do like to dip into Medium and see different articles coming up there. I think on top of that, for like broader technology news, I do quite like just using Hacker News and seeing what's kind of on the top feeds of what people are talking about. It's not always AI specific at all, but I find that a good additional source to see what's happening. That's great. Okay, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Alberto, when you are done with those books behind you on the bookshelf, what do you go to for inspiration around data and AI? 
Yeah, exactly. So it's um, I also love a lot of LinkedIn. So for me, it's a great source to, particularly when I'm linked to people like you guys. So that, of course, it's a great source of information. And for me, lately, I've discovered the European Commission website that um, we talk a lot about sustainability and mobility. There are so many statistic data already available there that can give you an overview, for example, on uh, autonomous vehicles, the usage of data from connected cars, that uh, sometimes is not a very famous source of, um, of information, but there are a lot of great uh, statistics available that in, for mobility. Then uh, for me, that um, probably compared to the, my peers here, uh, I come from the business. So sometimes my, my way of getting also information is our business review. They're very great. Uh, stories, very simple that uh, I use, for example, in my stories and my storytelling, uh, because sometimes we know my main stakeholder are people from the business. So I try always to link to something that people can can understand quickly. Terrific. Well, I'll throw one in for you guys to check out the uh, World Economic Forum. I've become addicted to lately. Uh, the topics that we're talking about for sustainability, for AI and industries, for all these things. Um, it's a more of a curation service, but I'd highly encourage you to go check it out, um, especially in the area of sustainability lately. Uh, yeah. This has been a really terrific discussion. Um, I appreciate all of your candor and willingness to share your experience and knowledges with everyone today. Uh, Colleen, Deepak, Errol, Robert, uh, Alberto, thank you again for a terrific conversation. And that concludes our industry forum today. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you to our panelists. Make sure to stop by the Solution Theater for interactive demos on the most popular data and machine learning use cases in the retail and CPG industry. Enjoy the rest of the summit, everyone.